Dan is from Marblehead, and he has degrees in history, religion, and law, and claims that since his 20s, he was an artist, uh, and also a psychiatrist, counselor, a lawyer who worked in the trenches, and a poet and a performer. And he said that his poetry has been inspired by politics and war, from love and justice to endless quarrels he has had with the universe, from near-death experience and also from determination never to get too comfortable with life. And his poetry has also been inspired by his travel, and I know most recently he has been on a trip to India with his wife Angela and I believe it has influenced his uh, recent art including his poetry and uh, his, uh, perhaps his sculptures, sculptures, his latest sculptures as well. So we get the treat of uh, hearing his poetry accompanied by Angela Michelli, his wife, and to see some of his visual art. So please help me welcome Dan up here with Angela. We went to India for the second time in January and February. This first poem I'm gonna do with a chant was uh, based upon an experience of walking barefoot down a mountain, a mountain in uh, a place called Arunachala not too far from Chennai in the northern part of Tamil Nadu. It was uh, quite an experience of feeling the energy of the mountain. Um, I don't think that many people in this country have a tendency to walk barefoot down mountains, but there was no effort to stop me at that point. Barefoot walking down the mountain at Arunachala. Touch upon his craggy skin, Lord Shiva, who manifests as the mountain at Arunachala, just as he manifests as all there is. I feel the soul of my unshod soul caress the warmth of the mountain's rocky divinity. With each barefoot step, gracing a sharp-edged pebble or scraping the sweet crevices of the cracked earth beneath my toes, a gentle touch binds the barrenness of my feet to a deity's ruddy mountain. Resplendent through me, upward ripples of a snake's uncoiled serenity, a sweet ecstasy of consciousness as tangible as demigods, elves, or spirits, tickle my clenched calves and then cobra climb up the wobbly surrender of my spinely spine, dancing much as a serpent dances until finally a tropical fountainhead accrues at the base of my solitary skull. Shiva is inside me now. Step by step down the mountain's raucous skin. I enter where I never was, nor ever will be. But it is where I belong for the moments I am here. Walking down the mountain at Arunachala, God is gentle with me. The smile of a deity and a light-headed intoxicant swaddle my consciousness. No matter how much I try to forget when finally off this holy mountain, the touch of the mountain's godhead to my humble feet, I am sure, will sustain me long after I am gone. Arunachula Shiva, Arunachula Shiva, Arunachula Shiva, Arunachula. Thank you. We had the opportunity with about Usually I don't go, we, when we travel, we go by ourselves. But in this particular case, we traveled with about 25 or 30 other people. 
I call them pilgrims. This is not your usual group of, uh, of uh, North Americans. And we wound up in places uh, getting blessed by Shivite priests. It was uh, an opportunity to experience a very different religious tradition to, to anything that we've been exposed to here in the West. And I combined my experiences into one poem just to give an, a sampling of what we experienced. I call this Blessings of Shiva. Take off our shoes barefoot to Mother Earth. Ask Ganesh, elephant god of good fortune, to remove our aggressions. Joyous power, we succumb to our own worst comedy, latching onto earlobes with opposite hands, squatting three tiresome times, and with shameful knuckles, we pound our heads. The more ridiculous our humiliation, greater shall be our serenity. Deeper into awareness, we climb a stone block and whisper our heart's desire into Nandi the Bull's ear. Clarity will manifest our dreams. Self-doubt will thrust us to the ground, our bloodied knees painting stones below a sanctified red. We align to the march of a clockwise circumnabulation, chanting Vedic words in barefoot assembly across prickly grass under the Hindu heavens. With slowness we stroll in the shadow of millions of seekers through meandering thousands of unchanging years, knowing we have been here before in bodies of different colors, shapes, sexes, or centuries. Yet we've all, we are as we've always been, karma-weighted by the stones of unconscious actions, ensnared in the web of generations in pursuit of unattainable liberation. Humble approach to sacred gateway, we touch hands to the feet of Saraswati, sitting atop a lotus, the goddess of music and love, who prods purity of heart as our only sweet surrender. Up sculptured steps into sanctum, we are serenaded by the rhythmic rhyming of Gabriel's becharm blower. His stretched horn affixed to heart drum pounding of Earth Mother's blessed beat. Up hardbound steps, feet angled away, ensnared we are by the cylindered lingam, a phallic manifestation of all that lives. Inner sanctum, our knees ache, and we taste the bitter stone ground, yet are grateful in hearing priestly hypnotic Sanskrit in purified liturgy, echoing among God's many ancient voices. Bare chest priest, golden string attached to loose lower garment, aura of untouchability, entranced deliberation, cordon from contact with our profane pilgrimed hands. Lingam he douses with excitable liquids, watery and milky, remnants from which, like flowers, we blossom, proliferating life in Lord Shiva's name. Life, we learn, is devout and raucous. The scented lingam is laced in red and yellow floral patterns. The priest, in never-ending procession, sings songs, Sanskrit scripture, in muse as old as the heavens. Candles in a golden triangular holder are jested in circular celestial movements, time to bells that conjure transfiguration. Moment of blessing. Circular flames flower from a small gold cup 
as priestly gesture elicits pilgrim names and astrological birth signs. Pedestrian offerings we make in pursuit of earthly blessing, a good crop, healthy children, safe travels, prosperity, until we are offered sacred fire through which our humble fingers pass. Our visionary eyes are inflamed in sweet and solemn massaging until powders are offered, white powder for purity, red powder for life itself. Pilgrim hands extend right over left, powders applied, ring finger and thumb, painting portraits across unsullied foreheads. From darkness of sanctuary, grandmother sings in sonorous, soulful, Tamil, a song that attunes us to mystery. Priestly Sanskrit whisperings evoke a, a melodic counterpoint. Music from the inexpressible in archaic murmurings remind us of our divine origins. We are all children of God. So purified, if only we stay on the edge of a razor, where we strive to stride into the light of living. All of living is Shiva, yet all of living is illusion. Light and illusion. Lord Shiva binds us in his blessing to the miracle of what life is. Life is pain. And life is joy, but most of all, life is love. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, yes, I remember everything. That's all right. In 2008, we were in the northern part of India, and Indians do something that uh, we can't begin to imagine here in the United States or in anywhere in the West. Thousands of people, if not millions, excuse me, gather together, and they put the bodies of water to sleep. It's called the RT. And we participated, we witnessed one RT and then participated in five more. We, found up, we wound up in Hardawar singing and hanging out with the grandmothers. They spoke fluent Hindi to us as if we were their, their relatives, but we had no idea what they were saying. This is the RT that we experienced in Hardawar. I call this summoning bell of India. cowbells on the far banks of the heart of our Ganga. Children chant in an alleyway between buildings, their sweetness tuned to a drummer's thump. Flowers dance past us on the holy river. The people everywhere clapping. Sounds through long winded wind instruments made of plastic imitate the mooing of a tired river. Time to go to sleep. 
lights of fire and electricity turn brighter as the moon breathes down. Lord Shiva is far away now. Clang, 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 slippery slumber. The river must die tonight. We must all must die. Flutes play. Hear the children chant. People in movement sum in operatic fusion. Clang, clang again. Sing song children. Otherworldly songs. Ganga. Drowsy. It's current of Himalaya River swift carousing by. There is a promise we will all be cleansed. India is gentle tonight. These moments have been witnessed by our past lives. We see what we always see. You can never step into the same river twice, the philosopher said, but we are where we are. We are where we have been since the beginning of history. Mother Ganga is asleep, and it is time to discover the only truth that matters, the truth of our dreaming. Thank you. I want to say something about the sculptures on the left. My husband is a sculptor as well as a poet. And the one on the right is Saraswati, and the one on the left is Gandhi. I mentioned Saraswati as the goddess of love and light. There was once a river named after Saraswati, one of the three holy rivers of the north. It is now a dried flower um, riverbed, literally, in uh, northern India. Actually, it's in Pakistan mostly at this point. And the other piece, of course, is the iconic piece of Gandhi. Uh, I'm about to read a piece that uh, I, it's an excerpt from a book that I put together. I wrote uh, after our first trip. I kept it as a diary. We managed to go on our last day in India to the site where Gandhi was cremated. It's a, it was called Gandhi's Samadhi or his blessing. It is considered one of the most um, coveted places or holy places. I should say in the, in the national lexicon of modern India. It's similar to, um, to the eternal flame where John Kennedy is buried in Washington. I compare the two actually. And um, I'm going to read an excerpt from my last entry, which was dated uh, March 23rd, 2008. Excuse me, Dan. Does he have time to do this? Five, sure. Five yeah, minutes. This is, okay. This will be our last piece. Yeah, it's short. It's only one page. Blessed are the prophets of nonviolence. They are always assassinated or crucified. Gandhi was a slight man, clad only in a curry-colored cloth, sometimes with a bent wooden cane in hand. That is, until freshly murdered, he was taken to this spot. His body, like a snakeskin, was melted so that his unleashed spirit could at last be free free. And in his name, India had cast off its subservience. Half a century from when he returned from South Africa, having already stared down the discriminatory British, he had become the living agent of a resurgent India that was about to face the world in all its prevaricating power. Through partition, this stillborn nation had suffered. It was a partition the great man detested. It caused a fracturing of his heart into two imperfect selves, divided by a common belief in God. Nonetheless, 
he danced through the flames of his samadhi flowering. Only the future could foretell in just what form the fate of his task, espousing a unified, resplendent, resuscitated India free of caste and religious fratricide would manifest in its snail-like crawl towards its, extra, its exalted transnational destination. His detractors, the British, the religious fanatics, the narrow nationalists, had climbed over each other to predict that his demand for ecumenical independence would forever languish as a fool's pipe dream. Still, the flame burned day and night. It burned on the sacred spot where the sandalwood had been torched and where the great man's flesh crackled. On this March day, we enfolded ourselves into the masses of men and women and children. Here, we were all Indian. We touched the spot, we breathed the air, and we aligned to our, va our vacillating spirits to the reality of the new nation as it rested its novel determination upon the effete shoulders of the world's oldest civilization. We stood before the People's Monument. Ordinary citizens had embraced their nation's origins. No one had to tell them to be here. They came in huge numbers. There were men in turbans and robes and in suits and ties and in dungarees, women in saris and in sleek dresses, Bollywood wannabes and rustic farmers, gem traders from Rajasthan, bond traders from New Mumbai, city brokers of corporate stock and rural brokers of livestock and other living things, sellers of musical instruments imbibing the gospels of the sitar, imbibing Springsteen, and students and squatters, they all came. If the people had a modern day deity like Rama or Hanuman or Shiva, here was where he exuded his final bliss. Gandhi, purveyor of impossible dreams, armed with the ineffable charity of nonviolence, had brought down the world's most tenacious military and commercial kingdom. The sun never set on the British Empire until a sleight of hand lawyer, no, more a magician, extolled dignity over power and the might of a centuries-old imperial colossus had crumbled like dried clay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for having us. Thank you, Cheryl. They call me crazy, zany, slightly insane, a chronic neurotic in his own domain. Cuckoo, bananas, cuckoo. Even his wife laughed and cried, he's nuts inside. He needs a vacation and way better medication. Crazy's back in my other brain. Makes things confusing, quite insane. So I see things others don't. I'll let you in on a little secret. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And I see a whole lot of things a whole lot different. It's just the type of guy I am. I like to cook and sew and use a chainsaw. I wear clogs, use hand lotion, and carry a man bag. I work out with iron abs of 48 children, a mean left hook. I don't take from anybody because I don't have to. Just the type of guy I am. Shut up, get out of my face, don't mess with me. Whoa, Richard, maybe you've had one too many. I don't drink. Maybe you should. Shut up, subconscious, I've had just about enough out of you. Can't you see? My plate's full, chips broken, my set don't match. Too many containers and still no lids. What I need is quiet. 
too many voices upstairs and we don't all get along. <laughs> Maybe my wife is right. I need professional help. To consider it would be crazy. To not consider it would be even more crazy. To need it would be really crazy. No, Doc, Doc, just listen. If the Hubble telescope can see life forms thousands of light years away, and we here on Earth are still making babies, then it reasons to reason that I am bi-terrestrial. No, not bisexual, bi-terrestrial. And no, I'm not stoned and you can't have any. Yeah, I know, I know, just, just, I know, my 45 minutes are up. One last thing, to imagine, to create something from nothing, to see it so clearly when no one else even knows there's something to see. Loco, I hope so, because crazy might be the only thing that keeps this guy sane. Thank you all, thank you very much. I pass this lake every morning without noticing, but today an oval of sunlit blue surrounded by gray clouds looks like a spaceship in the sky. And I'm trying to drive, but there's a ladder of slanted light floating down and my head jerks around like a robot suddenly given life. And the mist is rising and the face of the lake is still and serene as if in a trance or in a dream, waiting for aliens to step down the ladder and take her away. And I could almost want to go too, but there's a left turn ahead and so much to do. and pear, apricot, then this.